hello everyone welcome back we are starting our lecture number three and we'll be here for about two hours and this is financial management paper so welcome back once again to our youtube channel however you'll give yourself about 10 minutes break in between those two hours for those that are returning back to our youtube channel i appreciate you guys and i hope everyone has actually downloaded the course materials from our telegram channel as we begin our class for today now we have to be careful because this course is made up of at least 40 percent theory but in between those theories they are calculations so you need to make continuous reading of the theory aspects so meaning it has over 60 percent computations or calculations so you need to do some reading of the theory aspects because it is these theory aspects that are backing the computations that we are going to have so i request you to stick to this channel because the calculations are the easiest and that's why i'm requesting you to read the theory and when you are reading make sure you stick to those that we've actually discussed and understand my arguments when it comes to the theories because i try my best to explain those theoretical aspects to you because i know they are very important now from our last lecture i guess you guys you have realized that by now we have started hitting question papers so i i request you and i would like you to move with that pace because every time i add i add on a lecture it means i'm adding something new in the previous lecture or in the lecture number two we did not finish some of these things there are things that we wanted to talk about but we never concluded them one of them we had the goal of the farm secondly we had agency theory we had also stakeholders so these are the key three things that we were supposed to talk about but we never concluded them we never looked at them in our previous lecture but the reason we are not able to cover some of the things is not that we just want to cover whatever we are supposed to cover but the issue here is that we need to understand to make sure that we understand the concepts by not just rushing through finishing whatever we have to do for the day but we need to make sure that we are understanding these aspects because as i said 
these theoretical aspects they are the ones that are leading to the computations and if you don't understand the theory behind the computations it will be hard for you when you're doing your self-assessment so we are not here to rush topics or rush concepts but we are here to understand even if we cover less but at least we have internalized everything so i want to start with these aspects that we never spoke about in our previous lecture so let me start off by looking at the goals the goals of the farm the goals of the farm then it will be followed by the agency theory and then we finalize with or at the end we we'll look at stakeholders if at all time allows us but if if time doesn't actually allow us we shall add these other that will remain to the next lectures and if time allows us we will be able to add in some small key things to do with essential concepts but for now let's dive in and kick start our new topic that is going to be on the goals of a farm the goals they are called goals or objectives objectives of a farm these are very 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 important areas and a bit bit technical so we need to understand and we don't need to rush them so this is another important area so when we are talking about goals and objectives it covers or it comes from it comes from the aspect that every company has what we call a strategy that's where the goals and objectives are coming from and by definition a strategy is anything that creates direction that creates direction into the future so anything that creates direction into this the future we call it a strategy in simple terms and every company or at every company that we may look at strategies are clearly laid out in what we call a strategic plan something that we call a strategic plan these are the things that you look at when you're doing business strategy but all these strategies they are laid down into what we call a strategic plan or we can call it a corporate strategy however you may not be aware if you are still at junior level in other words when you are still employed in these lower sections within the organization structure but those at the top the managerial levels they actually have access to what to call the the plan for the organization the strategic plan that has all the different strategies the company is supposed to follow to achieve certain things 
So, when you, if, if, if you are still at these junior level positions, when you reach senior management level, all this, you be on the senior management team, then you'll find that the guys that are seated in those positions, they do have access to the strategies, or they are the ones, they are the strategy builders. So you find that you maybe at your organization, you may find maybe the top managers, they are just seated in board meetings, they are discussing certain things. So they just seated somewhere, but they are thinking for the organization. So but what those guys actually do, they are what we call strategy thinkers. So they are thinking of certain things to implement to actually come up with what they want to achieve. But strategy, one thing that you need to understand is that strategy can be short term or long term. There are those long term strategies and there are those that are short term. So as a finance manager, or as a student who is doing this paper, we want to focus you on what is happening in the business. The examiner will not ask you what a strategy is, and that's going to be for business strategy paper on level three. But here, There is something that we pick and you learn the rest from level three. Here we are not going to internalize into what strategy is, what is a strategic plan, and all those things. Those are going to be done on level three in the paper of business strategy. Now, once you have goals, then they will be categorized when these goals are going to be categorized. We shall have those that we call the broader goals. And these, these broader, broader goals that we have in other words, when you have these goals, objectives, they are always categorized into two. Where we have, where we have the, the profit and then the wealth. But they are all grouped into what we call the broader objectives or broader goals. Now, we always have two, and this is where we pick these objectives. For example, you could be a company where we say either you promote what we call profit maximization. It's Either company is promoting profit maximization, or you could be a company and you your goal could be to promote wealth maximization. So these are the object the, the two objectives. But however, the way we design these objectives or these goals, you find that you can't promote both as an organization. So you are either a profit-led company or a wealth-led company. And that's how the examiner will 
tune you on. In other words, these are going to be, we are going to look at those companies that are profit, profit led companies and also the wealth led companies. So the profit led companies, these ones, they have, they focus on profit maximization. Then the wealth, the wealth led companies, they focus on wealth maximization. And we are concluding that you can't promote both. You can't be a profit led and at the same time you are a wealth led. You, you are, you are supposed to fall into one category. And even that's how the examiner is going to be looking at it. So, either the examiner will ask you the merits, because these are the things that the examiner is going to ask. You may ask about the merits and demerits of a profit maximization maximization strategy or goal or they, they may be the merits or demerits of wealth maximization strategy So that would be in one case, how the examiner can actually ask you. But before I focus on these two areas, because these are the, these two areas, they are the ones that are going to come in the in, in, in exams, and they are the ones that are disturbing students. But they come in a simple way, and I have mentioned the different ways how they, they may bring or examine these strategies. And even the examiner cannot actually trick them because that's how he's going to look at the goals of the firm. So if he brings these two aspects of where it's and profit maximization objectives, then that's how they will be. But students get challenged with how they can actually answer them. We are going to look at those areas. Now, whether you are going to be a profit led or you are a wealth maximization company or wealth led company we will always come up with objectives that that we must be able to carry out in order to meet our overall goals in other words we have the overall goals of the organization. Maybe they are looking at maximizing profit, and that's the overall goal. But before you look at the overall goal, you have to look at, you have to come up with strategies, or you have to come up with different objectives that you must carry out in order to meet the overall objective of the firm. And our overall goal could be profit maximization or wealth maximization, as, you, as I've said. So, for us to come up with what we call the corporate 
the corporate objectives that that we as a, as companies must be able to carry out in order to meet the overall objectives remember we said you can't be both it's either you are profit led or you are wealth led and that's the main goal of the firm so that's the main goal of the firm but for you to achieve this to achieve the profit that you want to look at you must set up other objectives and these objectives they are the ones we call strategies or the corporate objectives that we must do in order to achieve the overall objective of the firm now let's take an example let's look at some of the examples of those corporate objectives examples of corporate objectives these are the things that we must do if at all we want to achieve the overall goal of the business now when we are drawing these objectives these objectives they come from these the following key areas because these objectives are going to be generated from different sections because there is something that we need to do in the production there is something that we need to do in the in in, in selling a distribution there is something that we need to do as administration and when we do all of those things then we we are, we, we are going to achieve the overall aim of the business and that c may be profit maximization or wealth maximization so these objectives or these corporate objectives they are going to come from key areas so we need to first look at these key areas where the objectives are going to come from one it could be an objective focusing on on market it could be focusing on market objective focusing focusing on market and what can we do to a mark to our market in order to achieve the overall objectives so if we look at the market as a key area so how is this market going to help us to achieve the general objectives here it may be either that we are going to be looking at maybe market share gaining market share it may also be customer satisfaction customer satisfaction in other words we are focusing on satisfying our customers so that we can sell more customer satisfaction the other item we may also try to say that let's come up with new products or services products or services because if you are focusing on the market you have to look at are we dominating the market secondly are the customers satisfied with the services that we are providing then you have to look at the aspect can we be able to add in some new products to tap into those other opportunities that we may be seeing as an organization so 
so by doing all this you realize that maybe you find that maybe your products are not selling then you can come up with an objective to refocus your market and finally get a more market share because you may find that by focusing on the area of the market you look you may look at the market and you realize that your products are actually not selling all that as you, you expected it to do so you find that instead of you focusing on producing what you've been doing you change and you look at how you can improve your products so that they can they can meet the marketing demands and finally gain a bigger market share that's one one way that we can that's the first key area then the second key area secondly you may come up with an innovation could be in areas of innovation where you come up with one you may decide to come up with you can decide to come up with better processing better processing maybe methods secondly you can also bring in new products new products or services because by bringing in new products or services that is as per innovation you can make an innovation and make sure you add in some good products the other thirdly we may look at it may be in the in the area of it could be something to do with the productivity or profitability this one could be an area where you are supposed to focus so you may say you may come up with different ways of how you can be able to improve what you are producing and at the same time you find that that product that you are producing is actually making money so i'm giving you i'm giving you something that you can add on the broader aspects that we we have we we have but at the end of the day i will show you where the question is going to to come from the other fourth area could be public responsibility where you can come up with an objective that is focusing on compliance with the laws like if if maybe the company has been produce polluting the environment and in other words if the if you find that maybe you've not been doing some recycling of the industrial wastes you find that you've been polluting maybe the drainage channels and other environment aspects so to avoid environmental damage you can decide to refocus on the objectives of being compliant with the legal laws because if you are not compliant you may find that you are going to incur legal costs recently we are seeing NEMA is invading some of the organizations that set up their maybe processing plants in wetland areas so you should also look at it, it may be an area that you could look at however these business people the people that actually make money or the people that own these businesses sometimes they become very dense very dangerous because 
like those guys who are actually profit led those companies that are profit led companies for them what they are looking at they are only considering profits and nothing else so profit led companies because for them their overall objective is going to be profit maximization some examples that we may look at because what is going to happen is that in the exam they may actually give you a case it's the, the examiner can actually bring a small case and they tell you to to illustrate and show some objectives now in most cases someone who is profit led the objective the objectives will always be financial someone who is profit led the objectives are always going to be financial and even when they when they go into their board meetings when if when they go in the boardroom for their meeting they only talk about money so profit led companies their objectives tend to look at the things to do with money you find them talk, talking about increasing the turnover reducing costs so you find them talking about reduce the cost of this reduce the cost of that and they are talking about things that can help the organization to actually increase their profits but they are not looking at it. the other side whether they, these people were actually making the profit whether they are earning a good amount of money but strategic objectives should always be split between financial and then the non-financial these are the strategic objectives we are supposed to have the financial objectives and then the non-financial objectives we may try to look at some of the examples of some of financial objectives one to increase turnover to 5 million maybe 5 million US dollars in the next 5 years so this is financial we are just saying that the objectives they are including in monetary aspects only these are the financial objectives but what you should know for these objectives they must be smart smart means this s means specific they're supposed to be specific this so these the objectives it must be specific so whenever you read the the objective for financial objectives they are supposed to be specific like if you read to increase turnover to five million in the next five years it is specific in nature m m means measurable whether you are able to measure the objectives in other words 
are you able to measure that objective of course here we want to achieve 5 million so it means it's measurable a means attainable can we achieve it attainable or achievable then r means realistic realistic when you're setting these objectives you're supposed to be realistic in other words you don't set goals that you can't achieve then the t is the time bound the time factor time bound in other words they should be up to a certain point in time so that's why you're saying for the next five years so can we attain the turnover to five million maybe us dollars in the next five years or oh, we can't so these financial objectives they're supposed to be smart so number two we may talk about number two here we are saying to increase total revenue by 10% annually for the next For the next five years now so it's measurable and even time bound because we have the percentage and we have the time frame however we said that these objectives are financial the other objective that we can look at is to reduce total costs whether production or company costs by let's say 15 percent or 18 percent annually for the next three years so we are looking at reducing the costs because by reducing the costs we are trying to increase our revenue so if you look at all of these objectives they are financial objectives and there are many companies of that nature Although the examiner can tell you to give examples of what we call the non-financial objectives. Non-financial objectives. Now, these non-financial objectives, they may not be taking that smart approach. They may not be smart or they may not be taking the approach the smart approach but they could be they could be there although they are not taking the smart approach now we can look we can try to look at some of these one to improve To improve the welfare or the well being of all employees, the welfare of employees in our organization or in our company. So, to, to improve the welfare of all employees, it's non financial. And this is very important objective 
And if you don't do that, then you might lose the best hardworking employees. Although the examiner has never brought a question to write about the objectives, but he can throw a four mark question in that line. But you need to you need to balance here because in this paper you don't pick you don't actually going to pick this from from the case as it is in the business strategy paper. So here it's more like an illustration as long as you understand that we have the financial and the non-financial objectives because in the other side they may bring in the business strategy paper they will bring a scenario then it will be you to pick some of those aspects from the case they have given you so therefore what is dictating having either a financial or a non-financial objectives are these two goals. The one we call the wealth maximization or the profit maximization objectives. So these are the two object these two objectives, they are the ones that are dictating whether we are going to be having a financial or non-financial objectives. So those two goals are the ones that are taking you in that format. So you need to pick, you need to pick me well, starting from this point, since it is where the examiner is going to pick the question for you. For example, most of the times, you find that these Indians, they promote what we call the profit maximization goal and they don't care about anything else. They only, they are only looking at the profits. And basing on that, that's, that's, that's how it was until these economists thought of the other way to increase performance because these Indians for them they were focusing on making profits reducing costs increasing the revenue but they were forgetting that they should care for the employees so that they can actually produce more units or they can generate more revenue so for them instead of focusing on the, the non-financial objectives they were only looking at the financial objectives and the main motive was to maximize profit. So it is until the, economic, the, the economists, they brought in what we call the wealth maximization objective. So the wealth maximization aspects, for it, it is very beneficial to both the shareholders and also the employees plus the public or other stakeholders because once the employees are better then more revenue can come in or they can be able to generate more revenue so that's what we call the wealth maximization objective because for it it looks to both the stakeholders the shareholders for the owners of the business and at the same time they look at other stakeholders like the employees however the examiner will not ask you which of these two goals you prefer but they will only say that maybe some companies still promote profit maximization even though it's not a good thing or they may say although some business owners are saying it's a good one so the examiner will ask you what are the arguments in favor 
of profit maximization. So the profit maximization objectives, what are the arguments for that are in favor? Arguments in favor of profit maximization. So what are the things that we can look at that can actually... So we need now to look at the profit maximization objective. Before we look at the objectives, let's now try to focus on the profit maximization objective or goal. So the profit maximization objectives, one, those who promote profit maximization as an objective or as the goal of the business. So the goal of profit maximization most of the time is, is short term. Because one year, as you prepare for the financial statements, you can actually see whether you've made a profit or loss. It is a short term. In other words, it's a single period. Like one year. Because with one year, you can prepare the statement and be able to see whether you've made a profit or you've not. So the goal is short term in nature. So it is always delivered within one year. You focus only on profits, then you can achieve it in one year. And it's done. And they don't care what happens after one year. Because for them, what they want to see is, have we made a profit? And that's it. They don't actually want to know how much is the profit. But they just want to know, have we made a profit? And that's it for them. And it's always achieved in one year. Whereas this could increase the profitability, because we look at it by making a profit, it increases the profitability in the short run. But it's likely to affect negatively the future growth and development. And even the long-term survival of the organization, because all you are looking at, we've made a profit, but you've not gone ahead to look at how much have you made as a profit. Now, the examiner will ask you what are the favorable arguments for profit maximization goal. So that was just as a brief introduction. So the favorable arguments or the arguments in favor for profit maximization goal or objective. So from this, the main thing that we are looking at are the aim of the business. Because for them, they are saying that the main aim, the main aim or the main goal of a business is to make profits, is to earn profits and nothing else. That's one of the reasons why they are favoring, they are preferring the profit maximization objective because they know that the main aim of any business is actually to make money. Two, profits, of course, if you make profits, profits are the parameters 
of the business operation. In other words, if you are making profits, we can look at, the, at your business and we say, you are actually working well when you have made profits. Then even these profits, they're actually a source of profit is the main source, source of finance. Because it is through these profits that we kept on accumulating what we call the retained earnings is what we can use to do other investment. Eventually, profitability eventually meets the social needs. If you are profitable, you can actually be able to meet the social responsibility. So profitability eventually meets the social needs. Because if you don't have money, there is no way you are going to do social responsibility. In other words, there is no way as an organization you are going to construct schools for the society. There is no way you are going to provide maybe some good roads. So there is no way you are going to be doing the social responsibility. So these are the advantages of profit maximization. It's an aim of the business. Profit is the parameter of business operation because that's where we start operating. That is the main focus as businesses. So let's look at the unfavorable arguments. These are the disadvantages, the unfavorable arguments. For all these are arguments against profit maximization objective or oh goal. One, profit maximization, it leads leads to exploitation of workers and even consumers because these companies when they are profit led they don't care what they have paid to the customer as long as they earn the profit the other thing is that these customers they, these are the people that are going to be consuming our products they are not going to care about them because they can do even wrong measurements. Because by doing wrong measurements, for you as an organization, you are getting money because these customers, they will be taking things that are not of the appropriate sizes. And for the company, it will be profitable to them. Two, it creates, it creates a moral creates immoral practices. Immoral practices such as corruption. So practices that are unfair, they may be in terms of corruption, unfair trade practices such as you find someone has packaged a one kg of sugar, but instead of having one kg or one thousand, one thousand grams, you find that someone is putting nine hundred grams instead of the one thousand. So one thousand equates to one kg. But instead of having one kg, you find it is having nine hundred grams. So those are the unfair. Treatments, those are unethical. We shall look at ethics later in the course. So, 
these are the things we are just only giving out a few but you'll find more of these the the idea is actually to get the concept therefore the examiner will bring the this question and it is going to be either you contrast it with the wealth maximization in other words if he asks you for the advantages of wealth maximization goals contrary to those of profit maximization or you may say you bring the advantages of profit maximization contrary to those of wealth maximization now let's let's try to look at the challenges or the drawbacks drawbacks or challenges or problems of profit profit maximization objective so what are the drawbacks so the drawbacks one it ignores the time value of money it ignores the time value of money we are going to look at time value of money it ignores the time value of money in other words for it doesn't care as long as you've made profits but it doesn't look at the timing of the cash flows when are these monies coming in secondly it ignores risks because we've not had anything to do with inflation they are not caring for changes in the interest rate changes in foreign exchange currencies they don't care about that then the other the other thing is it's vague it's it's vague so i need to explain what vague means in this perspective because the word profit as you hear the word profit it carries different meaning to different people because if you talk about prof profits in the re in the religious perspective it is spiritual something that is related to money if you talk about profits in the business language it is revenue minus costs so it carries different meanings in other words we don't actually know what it means and that's why we call it it's vague it doesn't portray its meaning so it doesn't actually tell specifically tell what it means and sometimes when you talk about profits someone is going to be wondering what do you mean by profit are you meaning the operating profits are you meaning the net profits are you meaning the profit before interest and tax or profit before tax or after tax so someone is going to be asking those questions so the word profit itself is vague it doesn't clarify what it, what exactly it means that's why we are saying it's vague then the other one we said when you are considering profits alone it fails to consider fails to consider the social responsibility of of the business of course when you are aiming on profits it means you are not going to do social responsibility to the public where the business is organized the other one it it is short term it's also problem, problematic because it is short term in other words in the long run the business may actually collapse 
Because for you, since the word itself is vague, you may be talking about you've made profits. But the profits itself, maybe you've made just one million of profit. You can't use this profit to sustain the organization. Even if you keep, you keep, it, you keep accumulating this, in the long run, you are not going to do any kind of investment. So that's all that we can talk about as far as as far as profit maximization is concerned. Now let's look at what we call the wealth maximization objective. Profit maximization goal or objective. So we are what we are probably saying is that the wealth maximization is the best because it's balanced since it looks at both the financial and non-financial objectives or goals objectives so what we do by definition because someone is going to ask what do we mean by worth? What is worth? So worth, it can actually be the present value of all future cash flows. Because, of course, by looking at the present value, it means you have already discounted your cash flows. So, wealth is the present value of the farmer's cash inflows. In other words, what you expect to earn in the future, discount it back to the present. That's what we mean. Whatever you get is what we mean by wealth. So this is the present value of the of all the cash inflows we anticipate to receive. For example, if let's say you, you've planted a forest, you have trees, maybe you have, let's say they are let's be specific to calyptus. Calyptus trees. Maybe you have, let's say, five acres. And maybe you expect to have, let's say, 100 million from that. In, let's say, in five years, you expect to get 100 million from those five acres. So this 100 million, is the cash flow that we are expecting to get. So we want to discount this because we are expecting to get this 100 million in five years time. So we want to discount it back to present or what we call the now. In other words, today we see how much is 100 million today. So we do that by doing what we call discounting we shall look at some of these words in detail so the figure that we've gotten in today's terms or the present worth is what we call wealth so let's now look at the arguments in favor of wealth maximization those who are saying wealth maximization is okay what are the advantages of it? So arguments in favor of wealth maximization objective or goal. One, 
it emphasizes that benefits are measured that benefits are measured in terms of in terms of cash cash flows in terms of cash flows the bet, what you expect to receive in other words in an investment or in a in an investment decision and the financing decision it is always the flow of cash the flow of cash that is important and not the accounting profits you know there is a very big difference between the accounting profits and the cash profits whatever that involves in, in the movement of cash is categorized into cash profits but the accounting profits has some different aspects the non-cash items like depreciation provision for bad debts and other things like amortization and all that so accounting profit is different because it will take away even things that are non-cash items like depreciation which are not involving in into physical movement of cash because expensing depreciation from the profit you've earned doesn't necessarily mean that you have paid out the money to depreciate to depreciation expense the other aspect is that it considers the time value of money in other words we are discounting it considers the time value of money we shall, we shall learn the time value of money or the time quantity of money because we shall see how we, why we call it the time quantity of money. Then the other one, it also looks at the risks. Looks at risks. Because by discounting, remember you are discounting these cash flows with a discount factor. So it gives weight to the risk factor by making the necessary adjustment in the discount rates. So if you have, if you have got your cash flows that are spread over maybe for the next five years, and maybe you want to, to know your worth now. If let's say you have these cash flows, let me just illustrate that. You have cash flows maybe for the year, 20, 24, 20, 25, maybe 20, 28. So you, you will see that maybe here you have 100 million. Maybe here you have, let's say, 5 million. This one is 50 million. And now maybe we are in year 2023. Just assume even though we are in year 2024. So the issue here is that we are focusing on the cash flows that we are anticipating to receive in 2025, 5 million, then 100 million in year 2028. So by discounting these cash flows back to the present, what you are doing, it's like you are taking care of the risk that is associated with that cash flow. Because we are going to be discounting for the different time period. Therefore, by getting the present value of the future cash flows, such that you are able to know your worth or the worth of your investment, then you are, you are catering for risk that is associated with that investment in the future. Then the other idea that we can talk about the other idea that we can talk about is the survival. 
it takes into consideration the long run survival of the business. Survival and growth of the business. So, it looks at other factors. So these are the things that the examiner is going to be looking at. It will ask you to give the advantages or the arguments in favor of let's say wealth maximization against profit maximization or it will be the other way around. So that's all to do with the goal of the firm. The other thing that we are going to look at is what we call the agency theory. It's also another technical area that we need to understand and see its applicability because it never misses. Agency theory. That's what we are going to look at now. So I need to first give it a background. So what you need to know is that when you look at the formation of the company, you'll find that once we form a company, there are things that come along with. But before we go to that stage, you'll, you'll understand that when you're forming a company, on the top of the company, the top, we have the shareholders. So we can represent it in an illustration. On the top, we have shareholders. Those are the ones that we have at the top. They are followed by the board of directors. And finally, what we have what we call the managing director. Or what you know as the CEO, chief executive officer. That's how Oh, that's what we expect to have as far as company formation is concerned. Now, the agency theory means the relationship between the shareholders, the board of directors, and the managing director or the CEO. And that's all. In other words, it's just the relationship. The relationship that exists between all these three stakeholders, all these three people, is what we call the agency relationship. And that's it. Therefore, Agency theory, agency theory shows the relationship, shows relationship between various stakeholders, between various stakeholders. So agency relationship is just showing the relationship between the various stakeholders in the firm. And because of that, it helps to explain the various conflicts and duties that occur. But what is important, we need to understand how it starts. 
and that will help us to understand it better. Now, let's see how the duties and the conflicts they are going to come out. And then we look at the relationship. Because we are going to look at the relationship between these two, these, these people. We are going to look at the relationship between the shareholders and the board of directors. Then we look at the relationship between the board of directors and the CEO. Because that's how it flows. It comes from the top, middle, then the bottom. So we need to look at the relationship between these three different stakeholders. So, now, the shareholders, these shareholders are the ones we call the owners. Or the owners. These owners, these are always many. Most, most of the times you find the owners or the shareholders are always many. Like for the Companies Act, they say two, two shareholders or two people can actually start a private company. For public, it is seven. So we find that there are many as per the Companies Act. Since there are many, then what they do, they do what we call they appoint. They appoint the, the board of directors. They appoint the board of directors to run the company on their behalf. They appoint the, to run the company on their behalf. That's what the shareholders do because they can't get involved themselves. So if they can't do that and there are very many, they appoint the board of directors. And it should be the board of directors that will be running the business on their behalf. But at the same time, this is the first relationship. At the same time, you should be able to know that the board of directors are actually not employees of the organization and therefore they are not going to be there every day and because of that the board of directors the board of directors because they are very many and they are not employees of the organization. So they are not going to be there every day in the organization. So what do they do? They go and employ. The board of directors are going to employ. Are going to employ. Or appoint. the managing director the managing director to run the company to run the company on their behalf so it will be the the managing director that will be running the business on behalf of the shareholders sorry on behalf of the board of directors and this board of directors, they were appointed by the shareholders. So, and below the managing director, we have others. Below the managing directors, we have employees. And the employees, they are the ones that are going to do, they do the daily work. These are the ones that are going to do the donkey work. They are the ones to handle the daily operations of the business. So the 
the agency relationship the same way you learned it in business law will be the same way that we are going to learn it here but we are not going to go in the legal perspective so when we are talking about the agency theory we are interested in knowing how does the principal relate with the agent that's the only thing that we are interested in knowing how the principal relate with the agent meaning the agency theory is all about showing the relationship between stakeholders or interested parties and our parties here are the owners or the shareholders the board of directors managing director and then the employees because you are now seeing we brought in three people we have the shareholders we have the board of directors we have the managing director and at the same time we brought in the employees because these are these employees are going to be employed by the ceo this is it will be upon ceo to to, to appoint some managers that are going to actually help out to sort the day-to-day -day activity so in that case it means there is going to be so the 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 the, the, the other aspect is that we are always going to have we have we have a principle and an agent that's what we need to know but now we just want to see how the principle relates with the agent in other words in between here we have what we call the relationship we want to look at the relationship between those two people so how is the examiner going to examine this the examiner will ask you the forms the forms of agency ask you the age the forms of agency relationship so from that they are going to ask you the they are going to ask you to explain the relationship between the principal and the agent those are the those are the two things so you have to look at the forms the forms of agency relationship and in this form we have only four forms we have only four forms one there is a relationship between shareholders and the board of director that is the first form of agency relationship so you will find that some textbooks they call, they will call the board of directors as managers but still they mean the board of directors and that's even what the syllabus calls it they call them managers instead of board of directors but they mean the same thing so here the shareholders they handed the business to the board of directors 
These guys, they gave out their business to the board of directors. And because of that, there will always be conflicts. There are going to be conflict of interest. So, the examiner will need to know the causes of those conflicts. Because these guys, they have given out their business. And it, that is going to cause conflicts among those two people. So there will always be conflict of interest. But the examiner will, will ask you for the causes of the conflicts. And these the, the causes of conflicts that they are going to ask, they are going to be for the different forms. Because it's not all about the shareholders. Even the board of directors and the managing director, there is going to be conflicts. So they will need to know the causes of the conflicts of the different forms of agency relationship. And then they will also ask how best can we be able to resolve those conflicts. In other words, giving the solution to solve the conflicts of interest. And the good thing I'm going to explain these aspects. But first of all, I want to I want you to understand the forms of agency theory. Secondly, let's look at the second aspect or the second form. We have what we call the board of directors, board of directors and employees. Then we have what we call the shareholders, and the creditors. And finally, we can look at also the shareholders and the government. Shareholders and government. But you need to understand certain things that when the examiner asks you for the forms of agency relationship, if you just outline them like the way we've given them here, We've just made an outline of these forms. If you just give them like the way they are, then you will not get any marks. So you need to first define what agency relationship is. If at all you are handling this, you define what agency relationship is. Secondly, you have to tell us or bring in the various types of agency relationship. After telling us what agency relationship is all about, then you can come with the different forms. So you don't stop by giving these outlines. You explain one by one. And for you to explain the forms, the examiner these are the things that the examiner wants. The examiner wants you to tell him who the principal is. And who the agent is. And who the agent is. These are the two things that the examiner expects you to answer. You need to show who is the agent in that form and who is the principal. Now, we can see that the principal is the one who employs the agent. The principal 
employs the agent. And the agent will perform the activities with the third party. So it, it is going to happen in this scenario. You'll find that the principal is above here. And is going to employ the agent here we shall see they will be employing then the agents are going to be working with third parties then the question is these are going to be working with third parties. Now the question is, what will happen here in this line? Because there is going to be a scenario whereby maybe the agent has done something to the third party. How is the principle going to be connected to the third party. That's also very important. Because as the agent performs always working with the third parties, mostly with third parties we have customers, suppliers, and others. And in the case there is a problem between the agent and the third party, the principal will be accountable. This one will be, will always be accountable. This one is going to be accountable to the third parties. So he's going to be accountable for any actions that may be done by his or her agent. And I hope you are getting my argument from this perspective. So since you've, you have understood this, then let's go and start looking at the forms of The forms of agents, agents theory or relationship. We highlighted them, but we are not going to repeat them. So one, we said we have shareholders and board of director, board of directors, or the managers, as the syllabus calls it. Now, so what happens here? The shareholders, shareholders, or the owners, the shareholders who are the owners of the business, they are the ones that are going to be acting as principal. So the shareholders who are owners of the business acting as principal, who appoints the board of directors as their agents to run the business on their behalf. And that's all. And you are done explaining your point. So the shareholders, they are the principal. They appoint the board of directors as their agents to run the business on their behalf. So if I'm to repeat, the shareholders who are the owners of the business acting as the principal who appoints the board of directors as their agents 
to run the business on their behalf and that's it so you are finished you have just explained the point and you don't include in anything as long as you explain who the agent is and who the principal is you are done we go to the second one the second one we said we have the board of directors or the managers and employees these employees will also include in the, C the CEO or the managing director. Now, the board of director here, the board of directors appointed by the shareholders acting as the principal, hire staff or employee staff to run the day-to-day -day activities as their agents. And that's something that is small but meaningful. So the board of directors, let me call it BOD, the board of directors appointed by the shareholders acting as the principal hire staff to run the business to run the business to run the business as their agents and that's it then we go to the next one the, the third one we said we have the shareholders and creditors So in this case, the shareholders in this case for the shareholders and the creditors, it's the share, it's the creditors, it's the creditors who are the principal. And the shareholders are now going to be agents. But this is how it goes. These creditors, we will say the creditors, who are the principal? Because these creditors, they are the principal because they lend money to the company and the company is being owned by the shareholders but remember these shareholders who appointed the board of director as their agents so the creditors will be working with an agent of the shareholders and because of that you must be aware that creditors are dealing with agents and they are not dealing with the owners of the business directly. So this brings what we call restrictive covenants. And we also have, now Omwaka number two we have this, but the restrictive covenants, these are things that are put in an agreement when they lend you money these are just things that they put in an agreement these are just conditions they put in an agreement when they are lending you money because these creditors they are going to lend money to the business but that business 
however much it, it is owned by the shareholders but it's not the shareholders who are operating the business it's the board of directors so the board of directors are agents of the shareholders so it means since the creditors are not going to be dealing directly with the owners then it will cause some problems and to sort those problems that's why they bring in something to, to do with the restrictive covenants these are examinable things so if you are to explain this you say creditors are going to be the principal because they will be lending money to the organization or to the company and the company is owned by the shareholders who appoint board of directors as their agents and because of that because of creditors being working directly with the agents of the shareholders and not the owners themselves it's going to bring what we call the restrictive covenants and you're done explaining it but we said restrictive covenants are things that we put in an agreement when they lend you money for example they may say if if you have let's say prejudiced assets maybe you have given out the assets as maybe collateral they can say that never prejudice those same assets anywhere or they may say if you are to do so you have to be in consultation with us they may also say never sell those assets if you have given them out as maybe security so there are some of the restrictive covenants that we may look at one they may stop you stop you from paying dividends they may stop you from paying dividends secondly they may stop you from doing any other investment stop you from investing because they may say that we gave you the money and that money should be invested in that same activity that we gave you the money for not putting the money to other investments they may also restrict you on restriction on merger or on margin if you want to combine with another company or you want the other company to buy you out they may restrict you they may stop you from disposing of assets so those are the things that we we looked out but we said there are conflicts conflicts of interest between i want to look at the different categories we have the managers let's start with the managers or the board of director and shareholders we've said because of the agency relationship there is going to be conflicts between managers and because it's the managers or the board of directors who run the company and the shareholders who own the company the other one they are owning the company and this one they are the one who's running the organization so the examiner will ask you what are some of the sources and this is a technical area if you don't know then you don't actually know these are very technical areas if at all you don't know you can't be able to add in anything 
number one we have salaries and allowances of salaries and allowances salaries and allowances this is a major source of conflict of interest but we need to know what happens so the managers they are going to pay themselves highly even if the company is not making profits and i hope that you get the idea of managers or the board of directors paying themselves highly even when the company is not actually making profits or even when the company is actually making losses for them they will keep paying themselves highly and that's one of the source of conflicts the good example that we can have you see what happened to utl the uganda telecom company limited because for it, it had top managers from, from Libya. Whereby these guys, even though the UTL was making losses, their salaries remained. And this is what we, what caused the conflicts or the conflict of interest. Number two, number two, we have differences, differences in risk portfolio, portfolios. So the managers might fear to invest in risk investments. But we all know that in risk management, the more risk, the better. That's from the risk perspective. So the investors may say, you invest the money. And then the managers may fear to lose their jobs. Because when the investment doesn't work out, they will lose their jobs. Secondly, since these managers are always on short-term contracts of employment, the contract of service. So, they prefer to invest in short-term projects. Since these long-term projects, they may start to realize when they are no longer employed. Therefore, their contracts you may find that maybe they are not going to be renewed and they will prefer to invest in short term so that they can reap the profits of their investments when they are still employed by the organization. Thirdly, we may look at the motivation, the motivation problem. It becomes a problem when the managers are not all that motivated this is very clear because shareholders they may, they may prefer not to motivate their people and then the managers they will find it hard to run the company without motivating the staff and that can also be a cause of conflicts the other one we can talk about creative accounting. Creative accounting is basically doctoring accounts, misrepresentation of facts. It's another way, it's, oh, it's another source of conflict. Because the managers might begin manipulating accounts 
for the sake of maybe dodging taxes, for the for the sake of having lucrative company accounts. The other one we may look at is takeover bids. Here the shareholders may want to sell off their company. And for them, they may see that it's a good transaction for them. But the managers might fight it because accepting to sell the company would lead to loss of their jobs. So by all means, they find themselves fighting the takeover bid. In other words, they don't want the shareholders to sell off the company even though it would be a very good transaction to the side of the shareholders. And that also brings conflicts of interest. Then lastly, we can talk about things to do with the divorce ownership and control. This is a bit tricky, but let's get the concept behind it. Now, what happens from this, the owners, they don't actually know what is taking place within the organization. And they will never actually control the organization. So, the organization or the company is controlled by the directors because the owners are the other side and they just depend on what the directors are saying since it is the directors who know what is taking place in an organization and that alone causes conflicts because the other guys they don't actually it's like they don't actually own the business because they don't actually know what is taking place in the organization itself. So this is a popular question because it's a bit technical in nature and the question could be about eight marks or seven where they, they may want you to show how these conflicts arises and then you propose how to minimize the conflicts. So let's now look at the mitigation ways or how can we be able to sort these issues. So minimizing conflicts. Minimizing conflicts. Now, one of the answers of minimizing conflict is threat to fire or threat to firing managers, firing managers or the board of directors. When the shareholders When these shareholders, they tell the managers that if you don't actually, they may say that if you don't actually perform as we expect, we are going to replace you with the other people who can actually achieve a performance that we need. And in that process, these can push the managers to actually pull up themselves so that they can retain their jobs. So it is just a threat but it will be a good threat because it will direct the managers on what to do. Secondly, we usually say that shareholders can incur further agency costs. And some of these costs will may be cost of monitoring management is activities. In other words, you find that 
you as managers, we are going to incur more additional costs, like the cost of monitoring what the managers are, are doing, whereby they institute the audit team to actually come and cut out the audit of what the managers have done. But just know there are those that are external auditors that are supposed to be there by law just to audit what to audit the organization but there is when the shareholders themselves can institute an audit team to look at the work done by the management so by incurring further costs to pay the auditors these auditors are going to be different from the external auditors that are supposed to be there by law for auditing the organization but these are going to be auditing the management activities in other words they are going to be delivering management reports so the other way is to set up commission remuneration or you set up payments managers remuneration remuneration or payments based on performance you can actually decide to give managers percentages so you peg managers remuneration to performance of the business like paying them commission say maybe 10 percent of the profit after tax and by doing that the managers will always find ways to have higher profits after tax so that they can earn better pay checks so you peg Manager's remuneration to performance of the business. The other one also shareholders can pay, let them pay good salaries. If they are if they are supposed to pay, maybe they are paying 10%. And it's going to be maybe 10% of profit after tax, this percentage should be good. Because if let's say someone has, has made maybe 2 billion in profit after tax, profit after tax, and the person is taking 10% of 2 billion, that's something good, especially for those managers. So whenever they increase maybe to 3 billions, 4 billion, 5 billion, even their pay keeps on increasing. So we need them to be rewarding paying the managers well. Even when it is just a percentage, it should be fair to avoid conflicts, especially by giving. Maybe they can try to give out some non monetary payments. The other one, number five, we can look at bonuses, rewarding managers with shares. This makes the managers to feel that they are part of the, of the organization and they can start to work hard or to work with a new energy because they will know since they are shareholders, they are actually making their own paychecks. So when you promise them to get some shares, maybe at the end of the year, then it means they are going to actually perform well. Then lastly, when everything has failed, then we expect shareholders in intervention, direct intervention. But that one comes as the last scenario direct intervention by owners so 
when you see that things have actually failed to work out they can actually intervene and they fire all the managers so that they can reorganize the things that they are supposed to to achieve in an organization so that's basically what we can talk about as far as minimizing conflicts is concerned let's look at now something new and this is going to be on stakeholders stakeholders now we, we all work for companies and everybody has what we call stakeholders whether you're working with which company whether you're working with this, which company every company has what we call stakeholders so even where the company is because where the company is located like the exact premises where the premises are located they are stakeholders and the stakeholders could be internal or could be external stakeholders so these stakeholders they may include without grouping they may be include shareholders we have employees we are just highlighting them we have the suppliers we have the customers we have the credit institutions we have the competitors we have the government government and its agencies because there are many then we have the community or the public or the society community public or society where the organization is located there are others however the examiner will not will ask will, will not only ask you for to give these stakeholders like they have given them these stakeholders that are surrounding any business but the question is always a two-way question where you will be required to identify the stakeholders and possibly their interest in the business and that's what the examiner will be looking at and that's what i'm calling a two-way question because they are asking you for the share stakeholder and at the same time they are asking you the interest so we need to understand who these stakeholders are and possibly what are their interest in the business so we need to go back to look at each of our stakeholders one by one as we are also showing their interest in the organization so a stakeholder a stakeholder refers or is any person with an interest in the affairs of the business or in the affairs of the entity because it may not be a business 
if it is a business the person who has an interest in the business so we give these shareholders it is just a matter of giving the shareholder and then their interest in the business and that's all so that's the only thing that we we need from them number one we have the shareholders the shareholders are the owners so shareholders are people who own the business and they are they also have a claim on the business and their interest is one they expect good performance good performance of the company but their main goal is actually return the return on their capital since these are the people that bring in the capital what they are only interested in is basically the return on their capital and that's see all with the shareholders of course they have to look at the company is performing well it can sustain in the long run the survival of the company is okay and it can be there for years as they keep on receiving their returns that's what we we want to talk about as far as shareholders are concerned so we talk about the, the stakeholder and then their interest in the business two we have employees When you're talking about employees, don't just come and say maybe they're interested in paying their salaries. No. We know that these are the people who are recruited to work for the organization. So their interest is actually knowing whether the company has a going concern. So by having a going concern, it means they are assured of their salaries and wages they will be coming. So they are assured that the salaries will actually be coming. And they are also assured of job, that is job security. So there are two things. We have job security and at the same time, it is the job security is as a result of the organization having a going concern perspective. In other words, the business is expected to operate indefinitely in the future. So if the company is actually going to be there, then they expect that their salaries and jobs are assured. But all in all, they also expect better salaries and better working conditions. Number three, we have the suppliers. Now, the suppliers, these are people who supply goods on goods and services to the company on credit terms. So their interest, the suppliers, their, their interest is they are interested in knowing whether there is also a going concern because by having a going concern they are assured of continuous supply you are going to be supplying the organization and they are also interested in the performance because if the the, the, the company is performing well performance of the company if the company is performing well it means their their money will actually be paid in time on time the other one we can look at 
are the customers. These customers, they are the consumers of the goods and services of the company, and they are interested in quality. They are interested in quality, quality products and services. Of course, even the price, basing on the prices, even fair prices, fair prices. The other one you may look at is government and its agents. Of course, these are only interested in compliance. Compliance with the regulations. Is the organization compliant? Is it registered? Is it not polluting the environment? Because these we may have even, is it paying taxes? So we have other agencies, the URA, the NEMA. So we have so many government agencies that base that need compliance to the legal regulations. The other one, we have the credit institutions. The, these are people who provide credit. So they provide credit to the organization and they are interested in being paid on time timely payments of the money of the interest and whatever they are also interested in the performance because there is no way they are going to give you the money when the when the company is not performing so they are interested in the performance of the company and they have to be sure that there is also what we call a going concern because they can't give you money when you are going to close because they may give you money and then you close so the other one we can look at the co the, the community Now, for the community, this is where the business is located. It may be a factory, and for them, they expect support through the corporate social responsibilities. like building schools, building hospitals, and other things. So there are many other things. We have also competitors. We have competitors. And for these, for these competitors, of course, they just want to look at your products. They see how they can compete with you. So, what you have to understand is that these stakeholders, they are divided into two. We've said there are those that are internal and those that are external. So, you can also come, up, come and categorize those that are going to be in the internal and those that are going to be in the external. Of course, the external, they are the ones that are many. External stakeholders, those that are outside the business, have, of course, the customers, we have the suppliers, we have banks or credit institutions or financial institutions. We have the government, 
and its agencies. We have the competitors. We have also the community. So there are others, but those are the ones that we wanted to look at. So the internal stakeholders, we have the employees, we have the managers. The other side, the other side for external, we're supposed also to put in the shareholders because they are not part of the organization itself. So the shareholders are the external that we forgot to highlight there. So those are the things that we wanted to look at as far as dyslexia is concerned. What we need to look at next are the essential concepts. Essential concepts of finance. And this is going to be our next. This is what we are going to start with in the next lecture. Thank you for watching.